what are we talking about? Stars, yeah. <laughs> you always talk about stars. I know, yeah. I, so uh, this was just a question that came up and we were just chatting about this and we're talking about the kinds of stars there are and in particular, you know, big stars, little stars. All right, what's the biggest star? That's all I care about. Is that what you want? Okay, yeah. we can do the biggest star. There it is. Doesn't look terribly inspiring. That's because it's quite a long way away. It has the inspiring name of R136A1. It's actually in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is one of our nearby neighbours. So the biggest star that we know is not even in the Milky Way? Absolutely not. There's two reasons why it's hard to find a really big star in the Milky Way. One is that when you're looking in the Milky Way, you're always peering through all the murk, all the dust that's there between us and the centre of the galaxy, whereas the Large Magellanic Cloud is conveniently well out of the plane of the Milky Way, so we can actually see it. The other thing is that there's a lot of very strong star formation going on in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Very massive stars are very rare, and so actually you need to have an awful lot of star formation happening for there to be just one of these popping up. And secondly, they don't live very long. They live a few million years, which means that actually you've really got to, at least in astronomical terms, catch them just at the moment they're forming, because actually if you blink and you miss it in astronomical terms, so actually you've really got to see the star, active star formation that's happening right now. So R136 is the general region it's in, A is the star cluster within that region, and 1 because it's the brightest star in that star cluster. It's about 300 times the mass of the Sun, which is big, and it's about, I think it's about 10 million times as bright as the Sun. When I were a lad, it was thought that there weren't any stars more massive than about 100, 150 solar masses. And there is actually a, there's a physical reason why you might expect there to be a limit for how big a star can be, which is that, so what makes a star is gravity, it pulls it together. But there is a, a kind of a, a countervailing force, an outward force, which is just due to the starlight itself, the radiation pressure from the star itself tries to push the star apart. So the light itself is trying to push the star apart. And the interesting thing is, as you go up to more and more massive stars, the mass goes up, they get more massive, but they get a lot more luminous. So if you add a bit more mass to a star, it gets a bit more massive, but quite a lot more luminous. And that means that even though in a star like the Sun, this radiation pressure really doesn't matter very much, gravity always wins over the radiation pressure, as you go up in mass, the, the mass goes up, so the gravity goes up, but the brightness, the luminosity, goes up a lot more, and so actually the radiation pressure becomes more and more important. And a fairly naive calculation says that the crossover point where the radiation pressure wins over gravity, so the star would literally blow itself apart by its own radiation, by its own starlight, is about 150 solar masses. I sent Paul Crowther, the guy who did this, an email saying, why is it that there are now stars more massive than we thought this limit ought to be? And he says the explanation is actually quite interesting, that although for lower mass stars, as you go up a bit in mass, the luminosity goes up a lot, when you get to these very, very high mass stars, it turns out the two go up together, that the mass goes up a bit and the luminosity goes up a bit. So there's no longer this kind of crossover point where the, the radiation pressure wins in the end. So actually these very massive stars, you haven't quite reached that crossover point and then you get, never get any closer to it because gravity and the luminosity go up together in the same way. As it evolves, it tends to lose mass, stuff gets thrown off the outside, so it becomes less massive, and it gets brighter. So actually these very massive stars, even though they can form, eventually they will cross over that line because suddenly they get brighter and less massive, so suddenly the radiation pressure wins out over the gravity and they will blow themselves apart quite quickly. Let me ask you the question, how do you know something's a star, right? What's a star? Well, a star is like a bowl of mainly hydrogen mm -hmm. gas that has like spontaneously started nuclear fusion. So you require, that's the interesting definition, part of the definition as to whether you have nuclear fusion in there. Of course, by that definition, a white dwarf isn't a star because it doesn't have nuclear fusion anymore. It did at some point in its life, but not any longer. There's no longer a source of energy in it. It's just glowing because it's hot. But for example, Jupiter gives out more light than it absorbs. It actually glows in the dark. And not because of nuclear fusion, but just because actually it's very slowly contracting with time, centimetre or so per year. And that gravitational contraction is actually liberating energy, liberating the, the potential energy. So actually if Jupiter emits more light than it absorbs, it turns out both these ends of the spectrum are hard to actually detect. The high mass stars are hard to detect because they're very rare and they don't live very long. The low mass stars, they're plentiful, there's loads and loads of them around, but they're so faint that they're actually hard to spot. And actually it's only in our neighbourhood that we can find them because they're so pathetically faint. So here is the lowest mass star known. There it is. Oh. It's called SCR 1845 minus 6357. So it's about 15 light years away. Cool. And it turns out actually it has a companion. It's a brown dwarf. And we see this one because we're seeing the reflected light from the star, but it's very, very faint.
we're seeing a brown dwarf that we normally wouldn't see because it's being shone upon by its neighbour. The sun, the most important star. Yep. Where is that in the distribution of star sizes? Boringly in the middle. It really is. is. It really, it really is. Well, middle. not quite in the middle. So if you think about it, so the lowest mass, so usually you think about these things on kind of a logarithmic scale. The lowest mass stars are about a tenth the mass of the sun, and the highest mass stars are a few hundred times the mass of the sun. So it's not quite in the middle. It's sort of somewhat towards the lower mass end, which I guess you sort of expect because there's more stars towards that end. What about this pistol star? Pistol star is about 150 times the mass of the sun. It's one of those that's the kind of the brightest ones in the Milky Way. It might well be the biggest star in the Milky Way, the most massive star in the Milky Way, and it's quite spectacular to look at too. The interesting thing about these very massive stars is that they tend to be in regions of intense star formation, so there's lots of gas around them, so they light it up and look very nice and actually the other thing you sometimes find with them is because they tend to blow off their outer layers because they're not very well bound together you sometimes find features around them that are to do with that as well. One of the things that people are interested in is the first stars that formed and what properties they had. Although we've never observed them yet, the prejudice is, the expectation is that the first stars to form in the universe were very massive stars. They have lifetimes of a few million years, so they wouldn't have hung around very long, but they would have seeded the universe with heavy elements. So you start off with the Big Bang, which makes your hydrogen and helium and a bit of lithium, but anything heavier than that you need stars for. The oldest stars that we can see around us today actually have heavy elements in them so we know they weren't the first generation of stars they're at the at the earliest the kind of second generation of stars there's two at least two reasons to think that those first generations of stars might have been very massive one is to make a star you need gas clouds to kind of fragment and collapse and to get something to fragment and collapse you need it to be able to cool down and one of the things that the heavy elements do is they sort of accelerate the cooling process they allow gas to cool down and so with heavy elements you can kind of create quite low temperature regions and actually have little things collapsing to make little stars. If you don't have those heavy elements, it's very hard for gas to cool down, which means you tend to make big things because it just doesn't fragment into those little bits. So we think probably that just that process of collapse would probably tend to make bigger stars in the early universe because it's hard for little things to cool down and collapse because you don't have the heavy elements. The other is that process we were talking about, about that competition between gravity and radiation. That what's happening is the radiation is, is kind of driving its way out and smacking into things and the, the interactions are much stronger if you have the heavy elements there. The opacity, the, the, how opaque the star is, depends enormously on how much of those heavy elements there are. So stars are much more transparent if you don't have heavy elements, which means that rather than pushing the star apart, that radiation tends to be able to escape more easily. So that process, competition between the gravity pulling things in and the radiation pushing it apart, if you don't have the heavy elements, it's harder for the radiation to push things apart so therefore you can actually make bigger and bigger stars. So that side of the process tends to make more massive stars stable if you haven't got the heavy elements as we did in the early parts of the universe. We won't be able to see them, will we, by looking back in time? That's the plan, yeah. So yeah. next generation of telescopes, James Webb Space Telescope, next generation of ground-based telescopes, next generation of space telescopes, we really want to be looking for those first stars to form and we will actually have the sensitivity to find them, particularly if they're very massive, because of course very massive things are very bright. So hopefully we will, in, you know, on the timescale of maybe a decade or so, be able to see those first stars as they formed. Wow. Four. Five. Nine. Two. Three. Zero. Seven. Eight. One. Six. Four. Zero. Six. Two. Eight. Six. Two.